It's my great honor to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. They have great senses of humor. I like to reveal parts of history to them for. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. It's easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. We're proud to be wellbeing partner at this year's Festival of Education, and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's well-being. This starts with a clear understanding of what well-being is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of well-being and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly. Welcome to this Festival of Education keynote session. Part of the annual Festival of Education, taking place online from the 16th to the 30th of June. This year's festival is free for all teachers and educationalists across education in the UK and beyond. This has only been possible thanks to the support of our incredible partners. A huge thank you to our headline partner, Pearson. Our festival partners, BBC Bite Size, Cognita and Teach First. Our literary festival partner, Bloomsbury Publishing, and our organising partner, Wellington College, the home of the Festival of Education.
We'd also like to thank our incredible speakers. Over 200 leading educationalists and thought leaders will be providing sessions at this year's festival. On behalf of the audience and organisers, thank you. It's time to sit back and get set for our upcoming keynote session. If you wish to ask a question during this session, please head over to our Slido page to submit questions and vote for your favourites. Enjoy this Festival of Education keynote session. Good morning, everybody. I'm Cindy Rampersord and I lead the BTEC and Apprenticeships business at Pearson. I'm delighted to be here today speaking before we introduce Kate Green, OBE, the Shadow Secretary of State for Education. I'm particularly excited to be here at the Festival of Education, albeit virtually, and I have to applaud Shane, Nick, and all of the team at FE Week for having the vision and the determination to go ahead and put this, this, this festival on online. And we can see by the engagement um, that many of you have really, really valued it. So fantastic and congratulations to the team at FE Week. Um, hopefully it will be Wellington College Grounds next year though. So at the moment at Pearson, like everybody else in, in the sector, our key priority is the delivery of the summer exam series. And I have to say a huge thank you to all the teaching staff in schools, colleges, private training providers who have worked tirelessly to get all of the tags, Q tags to us on time, um, the head, head of centre declarations, but are also now working with us on, on the provision of evidence around the QA process. It truly has been a collaborative effort across the awarding organisations, schools and colleges, training providers, the DFE, Ofqual, JCQ, uh, everybody involved in the whole process. And I know that everybody involved in the process is working towards making sure that we can land these summer results and make sure that no student is disadvantaged and they're able to go on and progress in whatever it is they want to do. Now, I want to stop for a moment and just reflect on what the pandemic has told us about the importance of learning and skills and the value of vocational education, um, what it's been in the past, what it was through the pandemic and what it will be in the future. Now, in terms of during the pandemic, it was really heartening in some ways for the first time to see vocational skills being truly celebrated and valued. Um, every day on the news, you would hear stories of heroes, and, and they were heroes, from the public sector, especially health and social care, the emergency services, the armed services, transportation, utilities, and of course, retail, um, food retail, distribution and supply. Many of these industries, many of these jobs, many of the wonderful people working in these sectors would invariably have gone down a vocational route. They would have invariably gone to an FE college or a PT or a private training provider. Not all of them, but many. Um, and they played such a crucial role in keeping us all going morally, but also um, just existing in what was a truly unsettling and at times fearful time. Um, so a huge thank you to those individuals. But, but actually what it showed was the value of difference and different pathways and vocational education and the skills that it enables people to have to provide those really important roles and services in our economy. Now, as we go forward, I think everyone recognises that, that it's going to be as important, if not as in, more important, to, to, to value difference in our education system and diff, different pathways. Um, the chief economist at the Bank of England recently referring to individuals of all ages, in particular adults, um, said giving displaced workers the skills they need to re-enter the workplace and thrive in it, importantly, will be key to preventing a longer term economic scar being left. So there's a real recognition. We've seen that in the government's plans with the, the skills bill, but also many of the initiatives coming out of the Institute for Apprenticeships um, that skills is important and they recognize the importance of it in terms of helping the economy to recover but also individuals to recover and there are many reasons why it's important and, and impacts that the pandemic has had now technology we've all talked about for for years and the exponential growth um, that's not going to change i mean pwc did a report um, i think just before the pandemic and they talked about by the mid 1930s up to 30% of all jobs would be automated or have an element of digital. 
Now, an another report that was done last year that spoke to the major CEOs of multinationals globally, and they talked about their product life cycles um, accelerating by seven years as a result of advancements in technology that have happened during the pandemic. Now, in addition to, to digital and technology, what we're also seeing is new institutions, new business models, but also a shift in values and a shift in what people are looking for. So we know that in terms of industry shifting, we've seen a shift in retail, for example, from the high street to online. I'm sure that's going to coexist in some way. But on the online side, there'll be still a demand for workers, but they will need slightly different skills um, to understand, to engage with customers. So the data skills, the analytical skills, um, the customer services skills in a digital environment, all of those will be crucial. But they'll also, if you think about um, younger people and their values and the importance to them of the environment and sustainability, um, and those industries growing and the roles in those industries growing, um, and what pand the pandemic has meant for working from home, for work-life balance, for a hybrid model, and the industries that might step up or or, or sprout up um, to support those 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 changing ways of working. So I think technology de development is really accelerated, but actually what the pandemic has also done is really shifted what's happening in in different sectors, growing some new sectors, but also. Um, I think had a real shift in, in people's values and what they're looking for. So what does this all mean for skills and learning and education? Um, in 2020, the Pearson Global Learning Survey was undertaken where they spoke to 7,000 individuals across seven countries and asked them what they were looking for in education and, and, and work. What was interesting was that, and you know, this is roughly bef just before the pandemic or, you know, the, the, the kind of start of it, 87% thought that the skills that they need for work would be different in five years than now. That will have accelerated. So with all of that, I think that kind of rapid pace of change, there is a need for continual learning that is relevant, that is accessible, that probably will be bite-sized, really needs to be up to date, and, and actually is going to be crucial for individuals to remain relevant in the workplace and be able to meet their, to fulfill their aspirations. Now, the pandemic has also shown us that in addition to lots of change in industries, that has, that has actually had a disproportional impact on different demographics across our society. So there's a lot of discussion about the, um, the widening inequalities gap. And we know that young people, women, um, those from a black and ethnic minority background, um, regional variation, regionally, that there's been some real variations and people have been disproportionately impacted. And the data is telling us this. Um, so we know, for example, um, if we look at young people, um, that in the period from March 2020 to March 2021, there were 813 um, fewer people on the UK payroll register. Of that, 53.7% were the under 25s, which is quite stark. You know, young people starting out in their lives and actually um, unable to access um, employment. We also know that in for women, um, that there's been some concerns raised by the Women and Equalities Commission that some of the investment plans around the economy um, and the recovery of the economy is skewed more to male dominated sectors. And I think this is a really interesting point because we know that STEM and technology generally attracts fewer females or women, but also as you go up the pyramid, there are there are fewer. But actually, if those are going to be the sectors that are going to thriving in the future, or those or technology and digital are going to be embedded in, in most sectors, we're really going to have to be thinking about the engagement of girls and women into technology and into STEM um, to really make sure that we don't end up with a with um with quite a significant gap going forward. Um, so you know, data is telling us that we've got a widening inequality gap across a number of different areas. Um, and it is important to act now, um, because if we don't act now, as the, as the chief economist of the Bank of England said, we will end up with um, potentially a bottomless 20%, which actually morally is 
quite shocking, but also economically and fiscally, uh, from a fiscal standpoint, actually is is not something that that I guess we should be aspiring to or, or heading heading towards without thinking. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom because I think what I'm saying is that skills and learning is going to remain crucial, but it's going to be it's going to be crucial within the context of a post um, pandemic world and a fast changing, rapidly changing world. So agility and relevance and continual are the things that we'll need in adult learning. Um, but I'm really optimistic. I'm hugely optimistic about the skill system and, and the people that work in the skill system, um, the colleges, the private training providers, um, the awarding organizations, um, the role they can play um, to really support learners and support the the, the curriculum. Um, they've been, as a sector, we've been agile um, and will continue to be agile and continue to put learners at the centre of what we do um, and help them make help them access learning so that they can make progress in their lives. Um, so now I will hand over to the editor of Schools Week, John Dickens, to introduce the Shadow Secretary of State for Education. Thank you. Good morning, Festival. I hope that you all had a good weekend. Uh, welcome to the first keynote of day nine of the Festival of Education. As Cindy just said, I'm John Dickens, the editor of Schools Week. At the start of the festival, we heard from the Secretary of State, Gavin Williamson, and this morning we will hear from his opposite number, Kate Green, MP. Kate was elected MP for Streatham and Ermstam in May 2010. She joined Keir Starmer's top team as Shadow Secretary of State for Education in June last year. Kate is a long-standing advocate for families and children and campaigner against poverty and equality. She also served as a magistrate for 16 years and takes a particular interest in the experience of women in the penal system and how best to rehabilitate them to prevent reoffending. Following Kate's speech, I will be back for a Q&A, so please do submit your questions via Slido and please welcome the Shadow Education Secretary, Kate Green. Well, thank you so much, John, and thank you to uh, the Festival of Education for inviting me to speak today. It's a huge pleasure uh, to be here with you, albeit I'm sad not to be here in real life. Um, but every year this event brings together so many people who care deeply about our education system, about the children it supports, the staff it employs and the society that it shapes. And of course, this year, more perhaps than in any other year in recent memory, there is so much for us to discuss and to share, so much to learn from after the exceptional events that we've been living through over the past 15 months. Because there hasn't been a day, I don't think, of my, my first year in post as Shadow Education Secretary when our education system and the people in it have not been doing something extraordinary. Moving to deliver remote learning while supporting the most vulnerable children in the classroom, navigating two consecutive years of chaos on assessment, created, I have to say, entirely by government inaction, and now doing everything you can to support children's recovery as we hopefully begin the return to normality. But the immense gratitude that we owe all of those in our education system cannot be expressed simply with warm words or fine speeches. It needs to be the basis of a new settlement for our education system, one that brings together politicians, educators, students and families with a, a shared understanding of what we've experienced over the last year and how we drive a recovery that's genuinely fair for all and ensures that no child is left behind as we move forward. And at the heart of that settlement, there needs to be an agreement that government will work with, not against the professionals in our schools and colleges across the country, because our children only succeed when their schools have staff who can support their learning. As we look at the enormous pressure on students and staff in our schools and colleges as we reach the end of what's been an exceptionally challenging academic year, the consequences of a government failing to work with our education system are, are all too plainly visible. Teachers are now desperate for a well-earned break as we approach the summer, 
but many are already apprehensive about this summer's GCSE, A-level and VTQ results, as are students and their families. Young people and their parents are worrying about whether they'll get the grades they need for the next stage of their life, whether that's in university, college, an apprenticeship, or the workplace. Students have spent years working towards this point, but they fear that all of their hard work will be thrown into disarray in another summer of exams chaos that everyone, except it seems the government, could see coming months ago. Teachers and school leaders across the country are desperate to do the right thing for their students in these incredibly challenging circumstances. They want to be fair and to ensure that young people can progress to the next stage in their life journey. But the government's failure to put in place a credible plan has put education staff under enormous pressure, exacerbating already all but unmanageable workloads and putting them on the front line of a system that many fear will create distress and confrontation between teachers, students and parents. Because while the government have said that they're backing teachers and supporting them throughout the process, the reality is they've been left to carry the can for a system that I am hugely worried cannot deliver fairness. I've heard too many reports from teachers and school leaders concerned about enormous pressure coming from parents to change grades if they're not satisfied with the grade their child is awarded. I've heard students comparing notes about the different ways in which they've been assessed, the lack of consistency, not just from region to region or school to school, but even within individual schools is really striking and it's concerning. It compounds the uneven learning experience that students have had over the past 15 months, as some parts of the country were hit again and again by COVID restrictions, as some students were sent home again and again to isolate, and as some lack the resources for effective home learning. All this could have been avoided. After all, we had plenty of warning way back last summer that for 2021, a robust assessment system with contingency plans in the event exams couldn't take place would be essential. School leaders, education unions and the Labour Party called again and again for a plan B, begging for a consultation, involvement and engagement from the Department for Education, pleading desperately for early clarity. But when ministers' response finally came, instead of ensuring that the system would be robust and fair, the governments effectively washed their hands of responsibility for the outcome. That's simply inexcusable. And the Secretary of State must now set out clearly what he will do in the next month to make the system for awarding grades as fair as possible. Because I know that this summer, teachers and school leaders, university and college admissions staff will once again be working flat out to support young people as they receive their grades and plan their future. I know that the effort that you'll put in, the long hours, the time you'll give to reassure anxious students, the care you'll take, to ensure they're treated fairly and are helped to make decisions that will enable them to make the most of their potential, come on top of 15 months when you've already faced exceptional demands and pressures. So I hope the Secretary of State recognises his responsibility to stand with and support you so that you can do the job you're committed to, doing the best for every one of your students. What's more, there can be no excuses whatsoever if government lethargy once again leaves schools, colleges, universities, staff, students and parents in limbo about plans for next year. For surely what we've learned from the experiences of 2020 and 2021 is that plans for 2022 are urgently needed, indeed long overdue, to give certainty that next year's assessments, examinations and qualifications will be fair and manageable. Next year's exam students have already completed a year in which their education has been disrupted. The emergence of new COVID variants and, and lack of plans to keep children in class and learning are already leaving those students deeply anxious. To repeat the mistake of 2021 and wait until the week before January exams are due to begin to start the process of planning and consultation would be unforgivable. 
a credible plan must be agreed in time for schools and colleges to prepare, and it needs to happen urgently. We all know that the consequences of the pandemic and of the unprecedented challenges faced by our education system as a result of it will not end this summer with the awarding of qualifications, but will be with us for years to come in, in every part of our society. And rightly, now, the priority of parents, families and education professionals is how we recover from the pandemic in our economy, in our society and in our education system. In the past 15 months, children and young people have experienced disruption to their education, indeed to their childhoods, that none of us could have imagined. And the impact on children has not just been on lost learning, although we know that a year spent largely out of the classroom has set back the education of children despite the best efforts of their teachers, but also lost socialisation and development. So the return to class earlier this year was a hugely important moment. Children have been excited to be back with their friends and teachers. Their aspirations for the future remain high. They're keen to bounce back from the effects of the pandemic. But we know that the impact of the disruption to children's lives and education was not felt equally. We know that in some parts of the country, particularly in areas of the North and the Midlands, more severe restrictions were in place for longer, keeping more children out of the classroom. For children growing up in lower income households, particularly the rising number going up in poverty, access to remote learning was a luxury rather than a right, as the government failed to provide the devices and connectivity they needed, and they struggled to find a quiet place at home to study. If we don't act urgently, to address these inequities now, then in the years to come, we'll look back and see that inequalities that were already present in our education system have become deeply entrenched, with millions of children paying the price, not just in childhood, but over their whole lifetime. And our country too will pay a price in wasted potential and reduced prosperity. A failure now to have a credible recovery plan a failure to act swiftly, urgently, and with a recognition of the scale of the challenge is nothing less than a reckless disregard for children's, for everyone's future. But the sad reality is that the government don't have a plan. When their highly respected education advisor, Sir Kevin Collins, presented them with one, they fell dismally short of what he said was needed. All they could produce was an offer of tutoring that while welcome is simply not up to the scale of the challenge, an offer that amounts to just 10% of the measures suggested by Sir Kevin. But where the government have failed, Labour have acted. We've set out a bold, ambitious £15 billion plan to secure children's recovery. We're grateful that we've been able to design this plan with the support and input of education professionals. And we're proud it's a plan that's based on what we know will work to transform the lives of children and young people. As any credible plan for education must, it begins in the early years. We propose hundreds of millions of pounds of new investment to support the most disadvantaged young children. In schools, we invest in what we know can make most difference, time, teachers and tutoring. We've proposed billions of pounds to create new opportunities for children to socialise and develop from breakfast clubs to after school activities, including sports, the arts, computing, cooking, reading, debating, giving children back the time with their friends that the pandemic took away from them, supporting and boosting their learning. For those in need of greater academic support after a year of disruption, we propose an investment in tutoring and in a recovery premium to enable teachers and support staff to give extra attention to those pupils who most need it. Under Labour's plan, every child who needs tutoring will be able to access it, not just the minority that will be supported by the government. And for the professionals who transform children's life chances, we propose hundreds of millions of pounds of new investment in continuing professional development, because we know but nothing matters more for a child's education than the teacher in the classroom, and that you cannot build a world-class education system 
without world-class teachers. Investment in the workforce is an essential part of keeping teachers in the classroom and delivering the education children deserve, and it is a priority for Labour. We also know that the consequences of the pandemic will not end when children turn 16, even if the government's plans do. So Labour's children's recovery plan also includes additional investment in further education through a new further education premium. Our plan is the product of the time we've spent in recent months listening to what children and parents have told us about their experiences during the pandemic, about what's important to them now, and to what the school leaders, teachers and support staff who have responsibility for supporting them have told us is needed to enable them to recover. I'm proud that Labour has a credible, radical plan that will support every child to learn, grow and develop. This is the plan that the government should have delivered if only the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State had had the political will to overrule a Treasury committed to the dangerous and false economy of not investing in young people's futures. But while Boris Johnson said that education was his priority in the recovery, the past few weeks have made it clear that his promises were empty. When Labour says education is our priority, however, we mean it and we fund it because we believe that it's only by making education our top priority that we ensure that every child can bounce back from the effects of the pandemic and that we build a future in which everyone, whatever their background, can fulfil their potential. Last week, the Secretary of State gave a speech in which he said that the purpose of education was, and I'm quoting, to give people the skills to lead to a fulfilling working life. Well, I'm passionate about the importance of good, fulfilling work. It's what the Labour Party believes in, the clues in our name after all. But I'm sure I'm not alone in my dismay that the top government minister charged with the care of our children's futures has such a narrow view of the purpose of education. Because while, of course, I want our education system to equip children and young people for the economy of the future, with the knowledge and skills they need to get a great career and fulfil their potential, that cannot be its only purpose. Children are so much more than would-be economic units going through our education system only with the objective of the employment that's to be their destination. Children's lives matter in the here and now, not just for the adults they'll become. They're young citizens of our country with developing and inquiring minds. They contribute their own ideas and experiences to our society. They have a right to a safe, happy and fulfilling childhood. It's the role of our education system to enable them not just to learn to earn, but to develop and flourish. The role of an education system that will enrich their minds giving them access to skills and knowledge across a wide range of subjects and disciplines, from mathematics and science, to our cultural heritage of literature, music and the arts, to our history, our politics, and the great shared inheritance of which they're already a part and will continue to grow up in. For Labour, our education system will never be just about preparing children for the world of work. It will be about preparing them for and enabling them to make the most of the world they live in as children and as the adults they'll grow up to be. And that's why our children's recovery plan is so much more than an emergency response to a once in a lifetime pandemic. It describes a vision of the way in which Labour would take the first bold steps towards building an education system that supports and enriches children's well-being as well as their learning because we understand that the two must go in hand, hand in hand if every child is to thrive and develop. Of course, no matter how good our plan, as politicians, we cannot transform children's lives and life chances without you, the education professionals, who every day release the inspiration, the vision, the imagination and the ambition of our children. To deliver our plan, our ambition, we need to work with you, and we want to do so, because I'm confident that together we can bring about Labour's bold vision to make this the best country in the world to grow up in. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today.
Thank you uh, very much. Hey. Now, let's move on to some questions. Um, we should uh, also be able to squeeze in some questions from the audience at the end, so so please do keep submitting them on um, Slido. Kate, I, I think the new shadow education team has been really forensic in holding the government to account for its actions during the pandemic, but do you think Labour has done enough to explain to the, to the electorate what its own policies are? You, you mentioned at the end of the speech there, Labour's bold vision. What is that bold vision? What is your big ticket schools policy, for instance? Well, I think I've just been laying that out, John. The Children's Recovery Plan isn't just an emergency response plan. It actually is a, a, a roadmap, if you like, for the things that we consider to be the bedrock of a successful education system for the future. And that includes, as I say, ensuring that we attend as much to children's socio-emotional well-being as we do to their formal learning. It's about ensuring that we invest in and develop um an expert profession to give children the very best teaching and learning experience in the classroom. It's about ensuring that we value learning at every stage from the early years, crucial early years, you know, where the investment actually gives us the biggest payback, right the way through school into college and university and the premium that we place in enabling um, young people to um, access a post-16 education system that will give them the skills and att attributes that they'll need for the workplace of the future. And less explicit in our children's recovery plan, but also very important to us is this concept of lifelong learning. We published um, prior to the 2019 general election, the, the findings and recommendations of our lifelong learning commission. Um, and as we enter into you know, a very uncertain future. Who knows what the labour market is going to look like over the coming decades or the economy? What I do know is that young people starting their working lives today will still be working in the 2060s. Who knows what the jobs are going to look like then? Um, we need to have a, a, a system that supports lifelong learning, retraining and reskilling as jobs change in the future. Um, and that, too, is a big part of our, our vision for the future of education. I do think we set out a lot of that in the Children's Recovery Plan. Obviously, the immediate priority, as I was saying, is to put the system and children and young people's futures back on their feet after what has been a really disruptive 15 months for them. But I think it points the way to the things that we regard as of value in our education system. And as I say, these are the things that parents, that students and the education professionals have told us matter. So I hope it's resonating with um, people listening this morning. On the education recovery plan, um, something that Sir Kevin Collins wanted was um, additional lessons, extending lessons, extending the school day. Um, I don't think additional lessons are in your plan. Um, why is that? So I think there's there's not really a huge amount of argument about this, to be honest, John. I think everyone agrees we can make better use of school facilities beyond the traditional end of the school day. And of course, many schools do, running excellent after school activities. And I think we also all agree that structured activities, as well as relaxed play and, you know, more informal um, social activities are both good and important for children's learning and for their development. Um, some of the activities that we're talking about, I know Conservative MPs like, like Flick Drugmond or Rob Halfen have talked about, are actually, we're all talking about the same stuff. You know, we're talking about computer coding, we're talking about book clubs and reading, and um, we're, we're talking about um, developing life skills like, like cooking as well as arts and sports and music, all of which are, you know, are, are learning in and of themselves and support other um, traditional, more traditional learning. Um, and it may be that we use some of the time at the end of the school day for some more structured, formal academic learning too, um, including perhaps some of the, the small group tutoring that we're talking about. I have been mindful that parents and teachers have talked to us a lot about how the first priority as we come out of the pandemic is children's social or emotional well-being, and that they do need time for play and, and social activity to rebuild that, that sense of well-being. And that's certainly and why that's given heavy emphasis in our plan. But I think we all agree that there's so much more we can do with structured and, and enriching activities in school premises, not necessarily all delivered by teachers um, at the beginning and in the end of the school day, and tailor those to be appropriate for children's learning needs, for their well-being, and, and you know, for their capacity for learning. Many, many children will be doing really well after the pandemic, but some will be struggling, and we, we need to take the time to give those children the support they need to re-engage fully with their learning.
What's, what's happened to the National Education Service? It was announced years ago. We still don't really have any idea of what's going on. Has it been scrapped, kicked into the long grass? When can we expect to find out more if it's still a thing? It's a concept, isn't it? It's, it's this idea of lifelong learning. It's um, this idea of equity in the education system, wherever you are, whatever your background. It's this idea of valuing education um, for its own sake and as a, um, a, an essential part of the, the um the infrastructure of our country. Um, we didn't really, in truth, before the 2019 election, have a lot of time to fill in the detail of what we meant by a national education service. I hope I'm beginning to fill in some of that detail um, in some of the things I've been saying to you this morning. Um, and it's very much um, you know, a useful, really useful um, concept, I think, for engaging in some of these discussions with teachers, education professionals, with students and families, um, and with employers. Um, but it's, it's got to be much more than just a title or a brand. You know, what people are really interested in is the content of what Labour is proposing um, for a return to a Labour government. You, um, you told schools back in November that you would review previous Labour Party proposals, such as scrapping Ofsted and um, abolishing tests in primary schools. What's the outcome of that review? So that review is still ongoing, John. In fact, um, some of your um, audience may be aware that um, my colleague Annalisa Dodds, who's just very recently been appointed to our um, director of policy, has kicked off a very big policy review process. Um, and uh, that will be engaging very widely, including, I hope, with people uh, listening this morning to, to start to look in detail at some of those big um, policy issues and, and make some choices and signal at the start of a process towards building a Labour manifesto. That's not to say I haven't been thinking about it since last autumn when, when I first told Schools Week I was thinking about it. And I, I may have said to Schools Week then, and I'll say it again now, I'm not so interested in what we destroy as what we create. You know, it's, it's about what do we need to build. So I think I'm becoming increasingly clear about some of the principles that need to underpin whatever it is that we create. Principles around... Um, driving collaboration in the education system, not competition. Principles around driving equity. Principles around ensuring that you've got an accountability system and, and you know, an, an inspectorate, and there's definitely a place for external inspection. There is no way we are removing that important uh, function of quality assurance and information for parents. Um, but it's important that that accountability regime drives the kind of activities in the classroom that we actually want, including, as I say, attention to emotional and social development as well as to traditional learning. Um, I think it's really important that there is transparency about how um, accountability systems um, and assessments work, how we show that they're in the best interests of children and young people's learning and development, and if they're not, we need to rethink them, and how we use them to drive excellent performance. So I'm pretty clear, increasingly clear about the principles. Um, and I think now under Annalisa's policy review, we have a real opportunity to begin to design the detail of some of that. Very much, I, I hope and want that to be in, in, in um, partnership with education professionals. It was announced on Friday that Eton College will partner with the Star Academies Trust to open three super selective six forms in disadvantaged areas in the north of England. Um, what's your thinking on that policy? Is that something that, that Labour would get behind as well? Or is, is that something you have concerns about? I think anything that you know gives more children the opportunity for an excellent education is is a good thing, especially children in really deprived communities. But we can't be relying on the goodwill of the Eton colleges and, and private schools of this world. That's not the kind of education system that I value and want to build. You know, 93% of our children are in the state system. That's not changing. And you know, while um, any support for their education from any quarter is, is certainly um, helpful my priority is to focus on, on making our state system the best system in the world, the best place for children to grow up and to learn in. Um, and, you know, I so that the, the offer that Eton College or any of the other private schools can make, you know, they have fantastic resources um, and um, small, small classes and all the rest, that we can offer that in the state system. That's what we've got to be ambitious for, for all of our children in state education. And that really is my priority, John. And, and what about the curriculum as well? You, you previously said uh, education has become a bit joyless as a result of a narrow national curriculum, which is information heavy and traditionalist. Um, how would Labour propose to change this? So some of the things I've been talking about in the Children's Recovery Plan and, you know, giving emphasis to the wider uh, disciplines of, you know, the arts, culture, um, Things students often say to me, skills for life. You know, they talk a lot about how they feel the curriculum doesn't make the time and space 
for those life skills that they want, you know, managing money, participating in, in civil society, and understanding our political system, all of that kind of thing. Cooking, even. A lot of parents tell me that they wish their kids were learning better cooking skills. Um, so I think we've got to make proper time in, in the curriculum for those um, subjects to be given attention and for children to have the chance to uh, develop and practice those skills. I think, too, we've got to get the right balance between knowledge and skills. You know, we've got a very knowledge um, heavy curriculum um, now and knowledge is important, but it's not the only thing that is important. So um, I think we've got to be thinking about whether we're giving uh, the right um, balance there and also the right balance between vocational and academic subjects. Increasingly, I'm looking at a government that's sending students down one or other of those routes, not down both tracks at once. And I think it's really important that we are able to develop students to have skills and abilities to, to work across both vocational and academic disciplines. That's what real life is like. I want a much more flexible curriculum and, and, um, and examinations and award system that supports and facilitates that, because I'm very sure that our narrow A-level or T-level, vocational or academic divide is not going to serve children and young people in the jobs of the future. You just mentioned that extra skills such as cooking or, um, or, or, or financial stuff in the curriculum. What would you take out of the curriculum to, to put those new things in? Well, one of the things we've been talking about, of course, is this use of school facilities across a longer uh, period of the day. So children are picking up skills and knowledge all the time, not just when they're sitting in the traditional classroom setting. And there is the opportunity to do some of those things in some of the extended hours that I think there's widespread um, agreement now. Schools are a good place for that to be offered. Um, I, I certainly think that there is scope to examine whether everything we're teaching in the current curriculum is um, valued and um, important to students and to their parents, to future employers and to teachers. That's a, a conversation I'm very interested to hear comments on, on from people listening today and from education professionals. I think also we, we need to look at how we use the school day. Um, and particularly in the last few months, actually, a large part of the school day has been used just to carry out assessments. You know, I've heard of you know, some young people have done 35 or 40 mock exams in the last three or four months. Um, you know, how are we actually using the time? Are we using it for teaching and learning or are we using it for checking progress and get that balance right? Um, and that, of course, speaks into the question you were asking a few moments ago about, you know, where is the thinking going on, on the best form of assessment? Um, and we need to make sure that we haven't got so much assessment going on in the classroom that we haven't got time for children's learning. And um, since, since the pandemic, there have been lots of calls for, for GCSE reform. And you, you touched a little bit on it there. But what do you think we've learned about the future of assessment during COVID? And is teacher assessment a, a, a viable long term plan? Well, I'm not a, a one club woman. I think we... I said before that the, we could see what was really happening over the last few months, and I'll say again, I don't think that um, putting all your eggs in the basket of one terminal examination has proven to be a risk-free approach, uh, as we've seen in the pandemic. It's high stakes. It, it came with um, risks even before the pandemic, and it was very cruelly exposed last summer. But equally, I think this summer we're going to see some of the um, real challenges in a wholly teacher-assessed approach around as I say, students having had inconsistent learning experiences and then followed up with inconsist inconsistent assessment processes, it's been incredibly time consuming. And um, I think um, it's equally stressful for, for students, actually. Some students thrive on exams, some prefer coursework, but I don't think either a teacher-based system or an external examination system is without pressure and stress for students. And it is our job to try and minimise that so that they can really show off the full um, extent of what they're capable of. So I think one of the things we've learned is um, that we need to set out the principles of what we're trying to achieve with our assessment system, that we need to be flex, looking at the best of all practices, we need to be making them manageable and workable for our schools and for students, um, and that we need to be absolutely transparent and build in equity. And um, there's some really, really excellent thinking I know going on around this, um, rethinking assessment, uh, thinking about GCSEs and A-levels and whether um, they should be redesigned, um, whether it's appropriate to have so many public examinations at those points in the way that we've got, whether an over-narrow curriculum post-16 is actually um, sensible and whether you might want a broader assessment approach. Um, I think we've learned a lot from the pandemic that was probably in our minds anyway. Um, and it says to me that whatever we decide, we will need to invest in ensuring that 
the people who are running the system, and that will include teachers and education experts, are fully supported and developed and trained to deliver it effectively. Because it's, you know, exams and assessments are crucial for children and young people's futures. A lot rides in them for those young people. And so we owe, to, we owe it as the adults in the system to make sure that we have the very best, most robust, fair and manageable system that we can deliver. And it, it is that exams? Do, do you support exams coming back next year? So I think exams have to be part of the mix, as does um, other, form of assess, other forms of assessment. I don't think, as I say, it's a one club approach. I would like, very much like to see exams take place fairly next summer. And as I was saying a few moments ago in my opening remarks, we need that plan from the government now. And we need to know if exams can't take place next summer, as it's turned out they can't this summer, what the contingency plan is, how it's going to treat students fairly and equitably. Um, I hope exams can take place next summer. Um, but, um, you know, we've seen how this virus has blindsided us on a number of occasions already. So we need a plan B. And schools, colleges and universities need to know that urgently so that they can start planning for these different eventualities. We, we are getting very close to the end of the session. I just want to quickly squeeze in one question from, from, from our audience, if that's OK. This one's from Lawrence McKell. Do you feel that this is a golden opportunity for education climate change? What would be the key aspects of that and, and what would the su success look like? I'm going to be very careful about using the word golden opportunity. I got myself into quite a lot of difficulty once before when I suggested that um, we could learn and um, um, develop pro approaches and um, changes out of the pandemic. But um, I think it has been a moment when we've absolutely been forced to face up to challenges that were already endemic in the system and think about how we need to and can do things radically differently. And I suppose for me personally, the single biggest shift in my own thinking over the past year has been this recognition of the huge importance of social and emotional well-being as the, the partner of effective learning, the equal partner of effective learning. And I think if we can embed that into every stage of our education system um, and design an education system that goes with the grain of children and young people's ambitions and optimism, then that will be a really inspiring system to learn and a really inspiring system to teach in. Um, and that really, I think, will enable us to deliver our ambition of this being the best country to grow up in. Um, and that, that excites me. I find that's, you know, it's, it enthuses me. It enthuses my, my team and my colleagues. And we're, we're very, very um, ambitious about what we think we can, we can um, propose for, for a forward looking education system for the future. Uh, Shadow Education Secretary, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we've overran, so I'm just going to have to wrap up very quickly. Um, for those at home, I hope you've enjoyed listening and, and please do enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's my great honour to welcome you all. It is a very prestigious award. It means the world to me. have great senses of humour. I like to reveal parts of history to them before. I love making history come alive. They are some of the best people that you can come across. To help them open their hearts. I always come back to this quote. How can we be role models to learners if we're not learners ourselves? It's quite useful to get out of our bubbles, not our COVID ones, and sort of see what else is out there. By sharing best practice, we can see the whole picture. We can see what really matters. easy to forget how much has to happen behind the front lines. As a global schools group, Cognita educates over 55,000 students across 12 countries. 
We're proud to be Wellbeing Partner at this year's Festival of Education, and we want to share the work that we're doing to prioritise children's wellbeing. This starts with a clear understanding of what wellbeing is. We looked at the evidence and created a simple Be Well Charter that everyone can use day to day. It gives a clear definition of wellbeing and then focuses on the specific contributors that influence it. Discover our full Be Well Charter video and other resources to use with your students and families at cognita.com. I really try to not look at myself as just a science teacher. I feel like as a teacher, it's, it's very important to help students grow and develop outside of your lessons. A single teacher believing in you and really believing in you. One teacher doing that can have a large impact, but if you have one or two or three all telling you that and really, really believing in it, it makes you feel like you can achieve anything in the world, honestly.